Okay. Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's TED-Med Great Challenges live event, sponsored by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I'm your moderator for today, Nina Martin. I'm a reporter covering gender and sexuality issues for ProPublica.org. I'm based in Berkeley, California. And now, allow me to introduce our participants for today. Anand Kalra is the program manager for Project Health, which is a project of the Transgender Law Center based in, Ber in Oakland, California. Dana Beyer, hi. Dana Beyer is a retired surgeon and board chair of Freedom to Work, as well as executive director of Gender Rights Maryland. Welcome, Dana. Thank you. Dina Fidas is the director of the Workplace Project at Human Rights Campaign. Welcome, Dina. Thank Kellen. you so much. Baker is the Associate Director of the LGBT Research and Communications Project at the Center for American Progress. Hi, Kellen. Hello. And finally, Marcy Bowers is viewed as a pioneer in the field of gender reassignment surgery. She's the first prominent transgender woman to perform surgery. She re to perform the surgery. She recently moved her practice from Colorado to the San Francisco Bay Area. Welcome, Marcy, and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for having Pleasure. me. Yeah, and thanks to Ted Med for sponsoring this great program. So within the Great Challenges program, we've had several discussions about the role of the patient in advocating for your health goals. But what if the very thing you needed was miscategorized in the system, or wasn't covered by any health insurance, or even worse? Today we're talking with members of the transgender health movement. Transgender health care has come a long way over the last few years. Still, it was only last May that the American Psychiatric Association unclassified gender dysphoria, which is formerly called gender identity disorder, as a mental illness. And immense barriers remain for many transgender people as a in terms of large out-of-pocket costs for non-covered care, all kinds of insurance snafus, self-censorship in the face of stigmatization, and limited access, of course, to adequately trained doctors and nurses and other clinicians who can focus on transgender care. So as healthcare adapts to better treat the transgender, the transgender community, its long-labored, rocky evolution has implications for our entire system. So today we're going to discuss the evolution of understanding and treatment in transgender care. We'll take questions from viewers on social media. Just tag your questions with the hashtag Great Challenges and we'll answer as many as we can today. Marcy, as a pioneer in the field of gender reassignment surgery, I'd love to open today's discussion with you. I think it's important for all of us to better understand your practice. Would you describe for all of us what the patient experience is like going through transition? The period leading up to it, the immediate aftermath? <clears throat> sure, uh, Kellen. It's uh, great to talk about this. Um, it's our day-to-day -day existence and uh, help uh, hundreds of uh, people each year uh, complete their journey. Uh, fortunately, there are many, many more providers who uh, help along the way and uh, by the way, pardon my um, pardon my speech. I'm I've got the lower half of my right jaw is numb thanks to a <laughs> dental visit this morning. So if I sound like I'm a little bit <laughs> slurred, it's a you don't. You sound great, actually. Um, well, thank you. So uh, there are many, many more persons coming out uh, recognizing transgender as a viable and important uh, medical condition that is worthy of treatment and whose uh, results uh, benefit. The, the persons that are served. So uh, that has that has uh, provided us at the end of the uh, cycle with a lot of really good support uh, psychologically to get through the process, uh, medically to get proper treatment and uh, evaluation and uh, to maintain safety for patients, and then finally the surgical process which, uh, which we uh, culminate uh, for people. Uh, my practice is about 90% uh, male to female and, and about 10% uh, female to male. Uh, not that that is the incidence in society, but just the fact that that's where my expertise lies. It's, uh, is in the field of, uh, of gynecology and especially uh, uh, especially well known for the, the male to female surgeries. Okay, 
Great. And so, um, Anand, next, Anand, I, next, um, you're involved in sort of uh, training clinicians for mm -hmm. um, through Project Health. So many clinicians are lacking in transgender care, but and they rarely have the training that they need. Can you talk about some of the most common problems that result from this lack of training, as well as some of the components of the efforts and the trainings that you're doing in Project Health in California? Sure, thanks for that question. Um, one of, well, what I like to say to people is that there's, there's two problems that people encounter. One is when a clinician doesn't have the will to help them, and the other is when a clinician doesn't have the knowledge to help. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, sometimes we see these compounding on each other. If there's right. no will, it's very difficult, you know, nearly impossible to, to be able to access um, the, the you know basic medical care, primary care that that you might need. But mm -hmm. if it's a matter of a clinician just not knowing what to do, what the protocols are, then it's a it's a it's a somewhat easier situation to to be in. Mm -hmm. it's, when once a situation where the clinician is interested, wants to help, but doesn't have the knowledge, then um, it, it, if we're able to get connected with them, mm -hmm. sometimes that's because of um, patients from the clinic that the clinician works at mm -hmm. organize together and reach out to us, or sometimes we get directly um, contacted from the clinics. Then we can go in, we can do trainings, we can find out, you know, what are people's um, comp medical competence level, which is usually very high, and what mm -hmm. is their confidence level, which is usually fairly low. Um, mm -hmm. I think medical practitioners are so good at doing what they do, and when they have the knowledge, they're very willing and very able to um, to carry it out. But when there's when an issue comes up that's outside of what they're trained in, what they know how to do, there's a fear that mm -hmm. um, there could be malpractice issues or that they might hurt someone. Sure. So. It, it tends to be just um, f fairly simple and straightforward of um, communicating the information, whether that's through in-person training or through a webinar, or sometimes even just providing mm -hmm. written materials mm -hmm. um, that can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. So does Project Health um, train uh, clinicians around the country, or is it primarily just in California? Right now it's just in California, although we have launched TransLine, which is an e-consultation service um, that okay. um, anyone nationwide can use. Uh huh. And how many physicians or clinicians have you trained in California so far? In California, let's see, the number of clinicians I don't know offhand, but we have worked with 18 different clinics um, in the last four years. Okay, great. So Dina, you authored and launched the latest results from the Corporate uh, Equity Index uh, at HRC just this last week. Can you talk about what that is and then tell us how are employers and workplaces doing when it comes to the, in, uh, to the implementation of inclusive policies and benefits for transgender em employees? Who are some of the best employees, employers? Absolutely. Thanks so much and thank you again for the host of this forum and it's always an honor sure. to be on panels with my colleagues uh, in this movement. So the Corporate Equality Index is the national benchmarking survey of how major businesses, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, top law firms and several hundred more you know, treat their LGBT workers and when we talk about you know, what are the needs of the LGBT workforce, we're largely speaking about fundamental workplace protections, um, equitable benefits across the spectrum of the community, so same-sex partner benefits, increasingly the majority of businesses are also offering opposite-sex partner benefits and transgender inclusive benefits. Mm -hmm. And then the third pillar of this corporate equality index speaks to um, internal inclusion of the workforce, but to sort of save us time on this panel, I won't go too far into that. Um, where we stand today is um, quite exciting. In just a couple of years, we've been able to, in concert, everybody on this panel and, and sort of within the community at large, uh, hold businesses accountable for more fair insurance options for uh, their transgender employees and then their dependents as well. And the very short history on that, as you mentioned at the top of this forum, is that to date, or really until the last couple years, most commercially available insurance plans had wholesale exclusions right. for transgender people. Mm -hmm. And so we began the conversation with Corporate America. The, the CEIs really are major tool of engagement and education. And we began the conversation in 2004 to make them aware of these so-called transgender exclusions. And uh, we revised our scorecard most recently to hold them accountable 
for full coverage up to a market standard. Um, major Fortune 500 businesses are in effect customers of insurance products and so they have that level of leverage mm -hmm. to, to say to the insurance community, the Aetna's of the world, the Cygnus, we want this to be part of your off-the-shelf offerings. We want this to be, uh, we don't have to we don't want to have to sort of start right. on you or go back and forth. Uh, so today we've got 340 major businesses wow. with this coverage. Uh, about 28% of the Fortune 500 offer transgender inclusive health insurance coverage. And in the coming months, you know, we're partnering with TLC and and other organizations to better refine the standard product offerings. And I, I think we'll get probably further along with some of the ex other experts on this call. Uh, but the, the sort of status quo right now is that many folks in the community, if they're working for one of these fortune companies, can get coverage for hormone replacement therapy, for uh, sex reassignment surgery, but other medically necessary options or procedures such as a tracheal shave or facial feminization, these continue wow. to be excluded. Okay. And so that's really what we're looking to remedy. Okay, great. Um, so, Kellen, you've been very a very vocal advocate for transgender issues in the U.S., but you're also working on them internationally. Can you take a minute to describe to us how other countries are evolving around transgender health? Are we really behind? Are we ahead? How does the U.S. compare with um, countries around the world? That's a very interesting question, um, trying to look at where the U.S. is vis-a-vis -vis other countries, because we're used to sort of the, the easier idea of what does it look like to have a right, such as, you know, for people in same-sex relationships, right. for example, getting married. But for trans people, the situation is more complicated, because what we're frequently talking about is a lot of different moving pieces within health care systems in different countries. Mm -hmm. And the United States actually falls into sort of a very interesting place because we are not as far along as we need to be huh. as a country okay. in terms of understanding what transgender people's health care needs are and how to make sure mm -hmm. that they're met, including, as Dina was mentioning um, and has come up a couple of other times, insurance coverage, right? right? Making sure that transgender people can get coverage, can get financial help to cover um, the health care services that they need. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, while there are many other countries where it's easier as a transgender person to get health care that's related to transition, one advantage of the U.S. system is actually because our system is organized more loosely around um, sort of the individual's access to insurance coverage and their relationship to their doctor rather than to a national health insurance system. What we find is people in the United States are usually more able to get specific services that they themselves need that are medically necessary for them as opposed to following a more rigid protocol. So again, we sort of see the U.S. you know, ahead, I would say, I guess, in some ways when it comes to recognizing that transition is an individual thing that's different for each individual person. Um, but again, we still have a lot of work to do when it comes to recognizing all of the different services that trans people need and making sure that transgender people are able to get health insurance coverage um, that actually makes it financially possible for them to get those services. And Kellen, what, would you say, what countries do you think stand out as being particularly forward-thinking on um, transgender uh, health issues? Um, there's a lot of really interesting work um, that's happening in actually the Global South, uh, particularly when it comes to recognizing a right to bodily autonomy and a right to be who you are. Um, actually, the best um, gender identity, gender recognition law in the world is in Argentina. <clears throat> and it recognizes that transgender people, we know who we are and we know what we need. And working with doctors, with healthcare providers, we can take the steps that we need to in order to um, go through whatever parts of medical transition are appropriate for us. Um, but I would say really uh, a lot of countries where the needs, where the changes in the healthcare system are really being driven by an understanding that, again, transgender people know who we are and we can work in partnership with healthcare providers, with healthcare systems to get to the point where our identities are recognized and where we're able to get the health care that we need to live authentic lives. Fascinating. And finally, Dana, 
This week, you I'm shared sorry, your story. Can I just uh, add just something? Absolutely. Go ahead. Because uh, I was contacted by the, Argen the, the health ministry in Argentina about teaching their surgeons there in Argentina uh, genital surgery. So it's interesting that socially and politically um, uh, transgender uh, rights are being emancipated there, but yet, um, yet much of the, uh, and this is where the United States does do a good job, is in the uh, advancement of surgical technique. And it's interesting that we're being uh, asked uh, to, to teach this uh, process globally. Another country, for example, that covers uh, transgender surgery in their national health plan, Israel, uh, here to four, uh, or at least for the last several years, had not had a surgeon that was capable of doing that. And so we uh, took our team and went there about a month ago to teach uh, Israeli doctors how to do the work I do. And actually, to that point um, as well, I think with regard to surgeries, particularly for transgender men, um, interestingly, one of the centers of that surgery uh, or those various surgical procedures is actually in Serbia. Um, so it's a, it's a really, we sort of see a lot of different um, areas of activity and a lot of different sources of expertise and knowledge, um, as Marcy was saying, and some real opportunities for um, collaboration between experts in different countries to keep moving things forward. Okay, great. Um, Dana, so this week you shared your story with the world about on the TED Med blog, reflecting in your life and your long work as an advocate for transgender health. From where you sit, um, what are the biggest hurdles that we have yet to get to? What are are we anywhere near addressing them? What are the some of the the things that you think have gone well? Um, also, I wanted to say well, this is a question from a from a listener. Um, you've been a long advocate with Sons of DDS, uh, DD, sorry, DES, on the effects of toxins on reproductive health. And can you sort of talk about that a little bit as you talk about your story, how re receptive the public and the media are to hearing about those kinds of issues, no, sort of first, in relation to transgender? Sure. Thank you so much, Nina. It's a pleasure to be here with you and with my incredible colleagues. I'm glad. I, I would like to echo everything that everyone has said. I'm glad this has become a bit of a global conversation as well because there's a lot to learn from the global community. There's also a long history, and I've studied this history. It goes back to the first surgeries, the genital reconstructions that were done in Europe in the 1920s. Then when the procedures were reintroduced, they, they came out of Morocco. Today, many people get their surgery, they come to the US for it, or they may go to Thailand, or they may go to South America. So it's an interesting globalization of being trans. When you mentioned DES, when I started my activism 15 years ago, it was on behalf of those people who were born having been exposed to DES in utero. And at the time we started, we didn't know that many of those sons, those who were assigned male at birth and raised as male, actually were trans. And one day on our listserv, I just happened to mention, I decided to come out. I don't remember exactly what prompted me, but I came out as trans. And suddenly, everybody else, it seemed, came out. And it turns out that 37% of our membership identified as trans. So all of a sudden, we knew that DES had been implicated in increased incidences of homosexuality. We didn't know about the transsexuality part of it. And we began to study it, and we finally proved that DES exposure can cause transsexualism. I have been, as a physician, a colleague of Marcy's and many others, promoting the fact that being trans is a congenital neurodevelopmental variation, a form of intersex. One of the reasons I did that is because I'm a biologist and a scientist, but another reason is in America today, people are more willing to accept you, be you gay or trans or anything else, if you were quote unquote born that way. And being able to produce evidence that we truly are born that way, I think has helped us become accepted in society. This past week in the Wall Street Journal, Professor Sapolsky, a neurobiologist at Stanford, wrote a great piece in the Wall Street Journal that is accessible to the general population explaining this. So I think we've come science is there. I don't think there's any doubt any longer that gender identity exists. There have been some scientists and physicians who denied that up until about 10 years ago. But also we've gotten to the point where people are recognizing that trans women truly are female in their brain sex and trans men truly are male. 
So yes, we have come a long way, a remarkably long way. It hasn't been mentioned that there was a time not that long ago where trans people not only were denied coverage for transition-related care or trans-related care, they were then denied because of their quote-unquote pre-existing condition right. access to any care. People died because they couldn't get any access. So in that respect, we've come a very, very long way. It's a supply-demand problem which has changed because the demand has been growing as more and more people have come out. Access has been a problem, but Kellen and others have been working through the ACA, which is now has its own anti-discrimination policies in place. So the access is going to be improving. But now, as I found, I'm working particularly with Kaiser here in the Mid-Atlantic with the great Ted Eitan to make Kaiser completely nationally trans-supportive that there is a dearth of qualified surgeons. There's only one Marcy Bowers, unfortunately. And so the supply is limited. And as a result, people have, have had in the past to go great distances to get their care. We need to improve that supply. You mentioned facial feminization surgery at one point. Uh, that was created in, basically by Doug Osterhout in San Francisco back in the late 90s. Doug would on occasion apprentice other surgeons to learn his techniques, but that's a very medieval guild-like kind of process and very slow going. Now there is a surgeon in, in Boston, at Boston University, Je Jeffrey, Jeffrey Spiegel, who has a fellowship program. So we're institutionalizing trans healthcare. The next generation will be better able to provide these services. And part of what I do, what Marcy and other trans physicians do, is to teach the next generation of medical students. I teach at Georgetown, at Penn, and it's very refreshing to go back and, and teach what we know to be the science today, where in 37 years ago I was sitting in the same auditorium and being told basically that people like me were perverts. So there has been a great deal of progress. The other thing that really needs to be done and hasn't been done yet is we need to know more about the science. There is very little work being done simply on the natural history of being trans. There's good work beginning in Europe. For instance, we know now that trans children have PTSD before there's any treatment whatsoever, before they're recognized and considered to be full human beings. Once the community recognizes that, I'm hoping that being trans will be simply another medical condition which will be treated with the same respect as others. But we need to be out there teaching. We need to be training the next generation of trainers so once we're gone, this will then perpetuate itself in a sustainable manner. Great. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I'm, does anyone have anything they want to add? I have a, a, a question that follows on that. Um, I think it's for Anand and also for um, uh, for Kellen and maybe Marcy, maybe any of you who wants to jump in. First of all, what are the the uh, what are the specific things that the kind of training that is being done, the kinds of specific issues that uh, n uh, need to be uh, that that clinicians in particular, not surgical techniques, obviously, but sort of maybe cultural competency issues or other issues that are a little bit broader. Um, that, that people uh, need to think about and are, and are learning um, that you guys are working on in terms of training? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so I think that, uh, and it, it, I'll bring in, I'll comment on a couple of things that, that Dana was just saying as well. So um, when we're working with clinicians, what, what we find is that the, the medicine part of it is really very simple. It's very straightforward in terms of hormone administration and you know assessing someone's readiness and you know and, and that kind of basic stuff. It falls very comfortably within the umbrella of general primary care. What's a little more difficult for people is um, is not the medical side of things, but is the the social implications of gender and being able to communicate to people who are very very trained in a specific um, epistemology, excuse me, a specific um, way of thinking. Um, from this very scientific background, it, it's more difficult to co to communicate around the the um, like I said the social and the cultural implications of gender and how we categorize it, and really getting people um, to to um, question is not the word I'm looking for right now, but to understand that there's so much taken for granted about um, what we assume out about sex and sexuality and gender that um, it's really a matter of you know what we call the trans 101 kind of helping people break apart these issues differentiating sexual orientation who you're attracted to from gender identity who you um, know you are inside and gender expression how you communicate that 
to the world through your um, clothes and hair and mannerisms and speech and, and, and all those kind of things. Um, that tends to be more difficult. And then once we can, once that knowledge is there, the cultural competency around gender identity, sexual orientation, differentiating those um, in you know in an interpersonal context, then looking at institutionally, um, that's where the, the one of the, the major major challenges is when we um, look at you know if you if you think about the last time you went to your doctor's office. And you um, you walked in and you checked in with a, you know with the name that you use and then um, they checked it against your insurance card which has your name on it and then um, when the um, medical assistant or nurse comes to call you and they call you by your name in front of the whole um, you know waiting room then you go back and get your vital signs done maybe get labs done all this happens before you actually see your clinician so if you're a transgender person um, one of the major barriers that a lot of people have is having documentation that matches um, their gender identity gender expression in most states um, almost all states you need um, a court order a legal name change um, to change your your identity documents and then you have to go through the you know a step-by-step -step process with every different institution that has your name and then your gender on file as well so um, if you if you imagine now that you're a transgender person who you have documents that maybe don't match and maybe your appearance isn't a traditionally stereotypical masculine or feminine presentation um, there's so many different steps um, in that process that you can be misgendered um, called by the wrong name uh, seem to be the wrong gender and it puts a lot of strain on people especially when we think about um, the fact that one in five transgender people has been turned away has been refused medical care um, you know there's there's all kinds of anxiety that goes into it and then remembering also that transgender people have lives outside of a medical context as well so there's you know all the different places that we go about the world in our workplaces in you know relationships in you know general public accommodations at the grocery store everywhere where there's you know all these little things sometimes big things being harassed or um, just being you know getting extra glances uh, stared at all this kind of stuff that puts extra scrutiny on people it adds up to a holistic picture of a lot of stress basically um, so so to your so to your question, um, there's the cultural competency about one communicating with the doctors at this interpersonal level, two then the institutional level working with you know in terms of the medical institutions, three I haven't even talked about insurance yet, um, and then you know remembering to put that in context um, that a lot of transgender people have a lot of, uh, have significant mental health um, challenges because of this extra strain that's put on from the extra scrutiny just going about in society as someone who doesn't fit neatly in these boxes what we call culturally induced stress disorder mm -hmm. sort of analogous to post-traumatic stress disorder right mm -hmm. yeah and I think you know there's been Anand brought up a, a couple of really excellent points that I just wanted to, to add on to you know that idea of the social determinants of health and you know Dana I think by another name minority stress um, what we know from a lot of the work that's been done um, predominantly by uh, researchers from and working in communities of color talking about the stress, the, the accumulated burden of being told over and over again in a thousand small ways that you don't belong or that you're not wanted in you know, various parts of society or different parts of your life. And that really takes its toll on transgender people's lives. Um, and particularly if you're talking about you know, going back to the social determinants of health, that health is not just something that happens in a doctor's office, right? It's what the circumstances that we encounter every day in different parts of our lives, the kind of job that we're able to get, the kind of education that we're able to get, how safe we feel in school, um, whether we're able to make ends meet, um, whether we're able to walk down the street um, as a person who is recognized as transgender or not, um, and being safe. And I, I think that you know, there's a lot that goes into, for transgender, for many transgender people, this experience of being extremely visible on the street and therefore in a lot of danger and simultaneously being invisible in a lot of ways in the doctor's office. Um, going back to what Anand was saying about um, you know, the experiences that many transgender people have had when trying to get health care in a doctor's office and it can be something that for some people might seem as small as a name, um, you know, being called by the wrong name, but for transgender people, many of us who have spent significant parts of our lives fighting for our right to be recognized as who we are, our names matter, our pronouns matter. We did some research earlier this year where we did focus groups looking at the experiences of LGB and T people 
um, when it came to health insurance and health care. And one of the things that we heard over and over um, from the trans focus group respondents was, you know, it seems small to you, but if you call me the wrong name, you, you're literally not seeing me. And that causes people to leave, that causes people to turn off from this idea that, that health care providers are there to help. And it means, unfortunately, that they, den that they then don't get the health care that they actually need to stay healthy. Okay. Um, I have a couple of related questions, um, both of them from Twitter. And again, I'd love anybody to jump in who'd like to answer these. Um, first of all, what can health care workers do to anticipate that their patients may be transgender and to make them comfortable during a clinical visit? Maybe Dana or uh, Marcy, and but also Annan, you can um, uh, you can respond to those. Um, a second related question is, what about the role of nurses? You know, people forget about how important mm -hmm. nurses are to this, um, to the care that most of us receive, and they're just as important, if not more important, than doctors, as we all know. Um, and uh, you know, and then how do you find uh, how do you find a good doctor? So these are sort of related questions. Um, why don't we start with uh, Dana? Well, uh, I think Dana had a, wanted to add something. Oh, us. sorry. Go ahead. Oh, that's quite, I was going to speak to a, a prior point, but um, I'm happy for this part of the conversation to go forward. I don't need to detract from it. Okay, I just no. I, I just want to respond to what Kellen said, which was right on point, and there's an inverse to that, too. I hear from my colleagues who are still practicing, and they're concerned that oftentimes they have patients who do function well in society and haven't run into those barriers, who then come in and don't out themselves as being trans in the office. I don't think that's nearly as common as those instances that Kellen mentioned, which are far more serious. But my colleagues say, I need to know who this person is. I can't give adequate care if I don't know that somebody is transitioned. They may feel that they want to just pass old phrase that we use in their accepted assign, reassigned gender, but that doesn't help the physician understand best who the patient is. We cannot provide the best possible care if we don't know the entire patient. So it goes on both sides too. But I will let Marcy, since she's currently in practice, talk about making the patient feel more comfortable. And I do agree that nurses play a huge role. Nurses often play a much larger role than physicians do. <clears throat> Thoughts about how to find a, a and how to, if you're a doctor or a clinician, how to how to approach people who may be transgender, may not know it, or, or you may not know it, or, or how to, if you're a patient, how to find care that is caring, mm -hmm. compassionate, and well, are there, there particular are, resources? You, uh, yes, there, there are a number of, uh, number of things that are out. I, I've, I wish I could direct you to some specific links, and, and actually what I will do, uh, our, our website as it relaunches is going to have a number of uh, directives that uh, will provide links for patients that can go to and, and, uh, and uh, they give recommendations not only for patients and, and uh, seeking that kind of care, but also for physicians looking for ways to improve their cultural competency uh, to make their, uh, their setting more accepting and uh, welcoming the trans patients. Um, as, is, as the point's been made, there's nothing more off-putting to a transgender patient than being, uh, than being addressed in a crowded waiting room by a name that doesn't match their gender presentation. And uh, so, so there, that's, that's one first step. The second is just in, the, in, the, in addressing the patient uh, themselves is that it's not just the it's not just the doctor that needs to get it right, but everybody from the receptionist to the nurse to the lab tech to everyone needs to be respectful of the fact that if the person is making an effort to present as one gender uh, or the other, uh, I mean I respect people who live androgynously and, and did not have a gender <laughs> designation, uh, that just complicates things further. But if someone's trying to live a little bit in the binary. Then I think it's the it's the, the burden of, of uh, fairness and uh, and uh, uh, ability to connect with the patient is, is on the, the providers who who just to get it right and it, it really isn't a it isn't a difficult thing if you get people to to just buy in 
Uh, so a little, a little thought, a little, a little uh, exercise. It doesn't take much to get it right. Um, we had the, we had the recent uh, prospect of, of transitioning an entire hospital system that had never had transgender care here when I joined uh, Mills Peninsula Medical Center here in Burlingame, California, uh, three years ago. Uh, there was no one doing transgender medicine uh, on staff, and so it's been a real uh, eye-opening experience for me. Uh, but again, we we went about uh, we went about educating staff. First of all, I spent a lot of time. I went in, and we had several meetings with each shift of nurses and all of the associated personnel. Then we had the lab workers come in. We did the same thing, uh, and then to my surprise, uh, patients were very upset because as their food was being delivered. The the uh, dietary persons were were getting uh, pronouns wrong, so uh, so what we did is we came up with each each, each one of these little uh, things were just groundbreaking, and what we were able to do then is just come up with a designated system where we labeled the patient's room very discreetly, not with anything saying this is a transgender patient, but just with a slip slip saying please check at the desk, and. Uh, so now we have uh, our nurses are so defensive and so protective of our transgender clients that they will literally, if a patient has a, has a, a procedure, let's say in a new department like X-ray, she'll go ahead and make sure everyone knows to get the pronouns right. I mean, it's extraordinary how this hospital has come around. But that can happen when one person on staff. It really doesn't take it doesn't take anyone special. It just takes one person you know, probably the provider to direct things, but to make it a priority to say we're going to get the pronouns right. We're going to respect this patient because we believe in in, in this process. We believe in in respecting our patients and and we want to we're there for them. And believe me, as a patient, uh, that comes across. And, and if I can just say something to that, um, I think the word, Marcy, that you used, eye-opening, is, is really a key thing here because if you look at, for example, the trajectory of the gay rights movement over the last, especially the last five years or so, a lot of it has really turned on people knowing someone who's gay, right? There's this, the, the research that's showing that something like 90% of, of Americans say that they know someone personally who is gay. The same is not true of what people say with regard to knowing a transgender person. Um, as Dana was mentioning, there are many transgender people who um, are not out about being transgender in different parts of their lives. And as a result, there's a lot of instances, um, including in the doctor's office, where, as again Dana was mentioning, uh, providers may not know that they're talking to a transgender person when, in fact, we are out there. We are in there. We are in those doctor's offices. And one of the um, biggest public policy initiatives that I think um, is sort of riding along with this is the need for better data collection about um, who transgender people are, what kind of experiences transgender people are having, both with regard to sort of the, the national population surveys that are looking at these snapshots of the U.S. population, you know, how many transgender people are there, um, where do we live, etc. But specifically within the healthcare system, um, needing to make sure that as we're making the transition, for example, to electronic medical records, that these records have the capacity to document in a way that's respectful for the patient and helpful for the clinician and other staff at the facility, document when someone is transgender because it is an, an incredibly important part again of making people visible within these healthcare systems so that people can get the care that they need. I'll add on um, to your question, Nina. Oh, I'm sorry, did I interrupt somebody? Go ahead, Marcy. Oh, I just want to say, you know, just it, this is one of the simplest things that a provider can do, just to take it as a as a just a quick snapshot. But just make your uh, make your uh, uh, intake forms uh, gender inclusive. So it's as simple as saying, um, you know, male, female, but also gender at birth, uh, and uh, or or agender, as some patients prefer to be. Um, in other words, just don't don't uh, don't narrow your forms to just two choices. And there are, um, if I can just speak quickly 
to that. There are a couple of facilities um, or organizations in different parts of the country that have been doing really incredible work about figuring out how to make sure that, again, transgender people can have information about their transgender status included in records in ways that are respectful to the patient while also being relevant for the provider. Um, one great example of that is the Center for Excellence in Transgender Health at the University of California at San Francisco, which has developed um, the question that Marcy was referring to, the two-step question that um, asks people to identify their gender identity. So are you male? Are you female? Um, are you, do you consider yourself transgender? Um, you know, sort of not identifying with one side of the binary or the other. And then also asks for birth sex because, you know, as we know, there are clinical, um, there is clinical relevance to knowing where people are coming from. Um, and another place that's doing a lot of really great work on this is Fenway Health in Boston, um, a federally qualified health center that works quite a lot with the LGBT community. And they have actually um, published some research um, that the Center for American Progress has also participated in about how to ask about gender identity as well as sexual orientation in electronic health records and in other um, data collection okay. instruments throughout the health center. Um, and they have a guide um, for frontline staff and others working in health centers about how to work with transgender patients. Again, that's at Fenway Health up in Boston. Great, thank you. It would be great to get a link to that um, research, Absolutely. by the way. Yeah. And I was sorry. just hoping, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, Dina, go ahead. I was just hoping to make a, a related but perhaps more global statement that in our work, and, and I think we've sort of touched on this in some capacity across the panel, one of the biggest barriers to the self-determination of care at the individual level, uh, but it also has seeped completely into the level of medical guidelines and clinical policy bulletins that insurance providers use is a, a reduction of the experience of being transgender to genitals. And I say that, you know, it's rather indelicate, but it's important to note because the level at which an individual can determine with their provider that the you know next course of treatment in line uh, or next surgery in line should in fact be you know facial feminization most of the time that's something that's going to get that that will be denied by that uh, insurance policy and that when you go to it it's not necessarily because any of it is truly informed by science that genital reconstruction is the sort of cornerstone of medical treatment but excuse me, instead it speaks to, you know, sort of stigmatization, misconceptions about what gender really is. And so I think for us, we continue to face that as a barrier at a structural level across insurance providers, again, with sort of, uh, you know, continued need for more data and more science behind it, but also at that individual level. And so I'm happy to be the one who's being more indelicate on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> but if it I, continues to be an issue for us. Yeah. If I can jump in here, um, Nina, I wanted to um, address your questions that you had asked a, a few minutes back. Um, first, about how to find a good doctor and are there resources for transgender people who are you know, individual trans folks looking. Um, there are a couple of resources, but there is overall just a drastic um, shortage of providers nationwide who are skilled and competent um, in providing care to transgender people. But that said, there is, the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association has a provider directory on their website um, that you can search through looking you know, for within a certain radius of your zip code. And one of the things that you can filter for is does that provider, um, you know, do the providers have, uh, say that they are skilled in, in providing care to transgender people. Um, it, you know, it obviously works better if you're in a very densely populated metro, um, metropolitan area, somewhat more difficult if you're in a more rural area, but you know, I did, I had someone ask me a question a few months ago, they were in uh, a rural part of Georgia, and I looked in the Glemma, sorry, Gay and Lesbian Medical Association provider directory, and I found someone who was really only about 25 miles away. So, you know, if you're living in a city, traveling 25 miles sounds like a long way to go, but for a lot of folks living in rural areas, people drive an hour, two hours, five hours sometimes to find the one doctor, you know, in their, in their area that they can go to. Um, another resource is, um, is Transline, which I've mentioned already, is an e-consultation e service that we've set up in collaboration with Line Martin Health Services here in California that um, if, a, if a doctor is willing to provide care but is inexperienced, needs some guidance, um, they can go online, submit their question, and, uh, and then a clinician 
uh, who has lots of experience working with trans folks can provide specific answers and medical guidance there. Um, the other thing that, that tends to happen is, uh, is kind of organically through word of mouth. If, if a transgender person, um, you know, because trans folks tend to, you know, we, we connect with each other because we're so isolated. Um, we have to seek each other out. So there's lots of support groups and social groups, um, you know, in, and informal networks as well, that once someone finds someone who's good, word spreads very rapidly and suddenly that there's an influx um, in into that particular clinic or to that particular doctor's office. To your other question about um, how clinicians can can make people feel comfortable to come out to them in an exam room setting, um, in addition to what uh, Marcy and Dana already said, I would add that there you know you can do very simple things that require um, very low effort but can be conversation starters. So that can be having materials in your waiting room, um, you know, as simple as a sticker saying you know, we support trans people, or even a rainbow sticker. Um, having there are specific um, you know posters that you can put up that show you know just an example of transgender people um, as being you know, and then and then when you come into that setting, instead of having this mentality of okay, I'm at a doctor's office, I'm going to have to fight, I'm going to have to advocate for myself, you can relax a little bit more, um, and then it's easier to to come out to your provider. Okay, great. Thank you so much. That's, those are really great uh, resources and hopefully we can have links and tweets and sort of spreading the news on those specific uh, resources. Um, I wanted to shift the conversation a little bit back to something that came up earlier, which is kind of policy. Um, so this month, um, the federal government sort of made movement that it might possibly start covering transition-related care through health benefits to employees. I think there was also a report earlier this week that it's considering uh, cover allowing transition surgery to be covered by Medicare. Um, certainly, um, Affordable Care Act has made a big uh, uh, it has potentially uh, really important implications for transgender health. Um, Dina and Kellen, in particular, but anyone who wants to jump in, kind of, can you talk a little bit about the, um, what, what is happening at the federal level um, in terms of, um, and I, I actually have spoken to uh, transgender woman patients who said, well, I don't really know if I can afford um, uh, coverage under ACA, it seems so expensive, and I was kind of stunned at that because she was paying out of pocket for for really expensive uh, medications and treatment. Um, can you talk about what the changes are that have been um, instituted so far in ACA that are being contemplated by the federal government and how that sort of changes the landscape, if it does? Yeah, from the perspective of the federal policy landscape, the Affordable Care Act, I mean, if you've looked at the Affordable Care Act, it's a pretty hefty tome, right? But it really is just the Cliffs Notes. I mean, the legislation that was passed provides a broad overview, and it's actually the job of predominantly the Department of Health and Human Services to actually fill in what all the different pieces of the law means. So when it comes to something specific like um, care for transgender people, what we really see from the Affordable Care Act is a sea change in our understanding of how insurance is supposed to work. Because prior to the Affordable Care Act, there really wasn't a lot of discussion of non-discrimination in insurance. I mean, insurance in a lot of ways is fundamentally based on discrimination. You parcel people out into different groups, and then you charge them different amounts of money for assuming different levels of risk, and everybody was sort of fine with that. And, you know, discrimination against transgender people was just sort of part of the whole mess. Now, under the Affordable Care Act, though, what we're seeing is a much more robust understanding that consumers, whether they're transgender or not, have the right to expect a certain minimum level of coverage and a certain access to coverage that, again, in, in our healthcare system with care being so expensive, is really important um, when it comes to figuring out whether people can actually get healthcare. So the Affordable Care Act includes a couple of layers of non-discrimination protections that are really groundbreaking from the perspective of transgender people. The first is the non-discrimination provision of the law itself, which includes protections on the basis of sex. And according to an increasing trend in courts around the country, as well as, for example, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Non-discrimination protections on the basis of sex include gender identity and sex stereotyping. So that's huge. A couple of other layers of protections are actually in the non-discrimination uh, regulations governing the essential health benefits, 
which are these 10 categories of care that most plans will have to cover. According to the Affordable Care Act, plans offering the essential benefits may not discriminate against people on the basis of their gender identity. What that means exactly is something that's still in flux because as I mentioned before, non-discrimination is not something that has had a very robust history when it comes to insurance. So right now, sort of what we're doing on the federal level as well as in states around the country is figuring out on a day-to-day -day basis, sort of step by step, what does gender identity non-discrimination mean in insurance? And actually, we see a lot of leadership on this coming from the states. Um, California is an excellent example, and, and I wonder if Anand might be willing to talk a little bit about the non-discrimination protections that exist in California and how California is defining what it means for a health insurance plan to be non-discriminatory on the basis of gender identity. Sure. Before we, yeah, Dana, do you have anything you want to add to that in terms of... No, I think it was very important what Kellen okay. said, particularly okay. about Title VII. And right, okay, coverage. great. And Sorry, and Anna, go ahead. Oh, thank you. So um, thanks, Kellen, for that um, that background. That's very, very, uh, it lays out in a really clear way for me. Thank you. Um, so in California, what we're seeing, um, in 2006, there was a law that was passed called the Insurance Gender Non-Discrimination Act, which among other things, you know, did other things, but one of the things that that law did was say that discriminating against transgender people in healthcare care um, is, is prohibited by law. Um, it took seven years from that 2006 law until this past spring to get regulations to implement the, the law. So what we're seeing now um, is that in, so, uh, in March and April, respectively, the California Department of Insurance and Department of Managed Health Care, um, which regulate the um, HMO and PPO sides of, of insurance here in California, um, they both issued guidance or regulations that um, clarified that the law does in fact apply to um, to all insurance plans that are regulated in the state um, and specifically um, along two different uh, uh, angles. One being uh, an angle of parity. So if an insurance plan covers, say, hormone replacement therapy for um, a woman who's in menopause or someone who has, um, you know, some kind of deficiency with an organ, so it's not producing the right level of hormone, um, but they, uh, but that insurance plan denies coverage to a transgender person for for a you know clinical indication of gender dysphoria or gender identity disorder, that constitutes discrimination. Um, and that's not okay. So basically, if a plan covers hormone replacement therapy for non-transgender people, it has to also cover it for transgender people. Um, most of the surgical procedures that transgender people who do uh, undergo surgery um, have are things that are that are also done for non-transgender people. For example, you know, especially with organ removal, his hysterectomy, ophorectomy, orchiectomy mastectomy. These things are, are very typical. Many surgeons know how to do these things. It doesn't require a kind of specialized training in transgender medicine. Um, so with these situations also, if, um, if an insurance plan covers them for not transgender people, for, you know, cover a hysterectomy for an indication of uterine cancer, for example, they must also cover um, at the same rate of coverage uh, a hysterectomy for a transgender man. Um, so, so this is the parity argument, and then the other thing is 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 um, is medical necessity, um, where we're seeing that you know the insurance companies we know they they are not the physicians, they are not the patients, they are people who are trying to determine how little money they can spend um, and get away with it. So, um, being able to to establish from the law and the regulations now that it really is. Um, a matter for uh, for a provider and a patient to decide what is the appropriate treatment for medical for uh, you know appropriate treatment or medically necessary care. Um, this is this is somewhat less um, clear in in terms of court and in terms of cases um, exactly where those boundaries are. But the law and the regulations are providing us um, access to complaints processes within the state um, and also. Um, hopefully moving towards being able to establish a clear body of, of what it actually means. Okay. 
Great. Um, okay. Well, this has been a really fascinating, great conversation, and we're winding down. I have one more question. Um, though the Great Challenges program is focused on issues that you know can't be solved with a simple cure, we can certainly identify smaller, less magical steps that might make a significant impact in the space. Um, with so many critical issues driving complexity around this issue of transgender health, what are some of the best places to start focusing our attention? And what are the things you can do to sort of see improvement in the short term in order to build momentum and gain hope for the future? And Dean, I'd really like to start with you on this. Okay, certainly. Well, <laughs> no surprise that my perspective will come from the role that uh, major corporations can play. They've played a significant role in the last year or two years, particularly weighing in on major public policy debates related to the LGBT community, not just marriage, but passage uh, in the Senate of the the Fully Inclusive Employment Non-Discrimination Act. So the extent to which corporate America can play a role in normalizing and institutionalizing uh, at, at, right, at present baseline transgender inclusive healthcare coverage, but increasingly as was said by the other panelists, we are all moving towards a trajectory in which self-determination is at the center of a medical treatment plan and that the uh, procedures and treatments that are outlined in the globally accepted standards of care that the that WPATH, the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, we will start to see those standards of care more fully integrated into insurance products, that that's really going to be critical. So that those are sort of more macro institutional steps uh, happening right now. And at the same time, I can tell you on a more individual level that I've been in this role for about six years, and I've gotten more phone calls of individual employees uh, able to transition on the job stay in their line of work and, you know, it may be trite to say, but sort of win over hearts and minds along the way. In other words, get more HR professionals, get their colleagues to more fully understand this, not only from a medical standpoint, but from a very human standpoint of being able to, you know, align one's uh, physical makeup with uh, one's internal true sense of, of who you are. So I think it'll be dual. There's institutional, but there are also <laughs> these conversational one-on-one -on -one changes that I think Kellen spoke so eloquently about. Great. Marcy, how about you? What, are, what kinds of small, what are the best places to start um, focusing our attention, do you think? Well, I think, uh, you know, I, uh, there are a number of directions, but, but uh, uh, one of the real dilemmas is that as we get more coverage is getting more providers to deliver on that coverage. So one of the real uh, one of the real bottlenecks I think in the future is going to be the the, the number of surgeons available. Uh, I've added another surgeon to my practice, uh, but uh, over the the recent history of, of transgender surgery, at least in the U.S., is that uh, physicians see their services as very much proprietary, and they don't like to share a slice of the pie, feeling that the, the pie was uh, uh, very finite and not growing and that they were worried about their own self-interest. And uh, I, I've, I've taken a very different approach, of course, because I went through transition, and I realized the importance of accessing care, and again, as has been pointed out, not traveling around the world to have to get good quality care. So I've been, uh, I've taught, I, I've taught a number of the providers that are out there now, Dr. Lease trained with me, Dr. McGinn, you know, from Dr. Lease, uh, Dr. Garamoni, Dr. Rumor, uh, there's people that have now, you know, the, the seeds of teaching have been there. But as Dana pointed out, uh, surgery is not a great apprenticeship. You know, it's not, not best taught as an apprenticeship. It really needs a fellowship. And uh, so somewhere along the lines, hopefully uh, somewhere like UCSF, some forward-thinking institution is going to say, we need a fellowship for surgery because this is a major bottleneck. Even if we solve the healthcare uh, coverage issues, for people, uh, surgery care is going to be a bottleneck. Okay, um, great. So that's that's uh, that's the that's the most immediate need I see is we really need okay. to get somewhere on the horizon. There needs to be a fellowship. Right. We have about thirty seconds left for one more answer. Who wants to jump in? I'll just say that I think people need to come out. As was pointed okay. out earlier, okay. we've made progress in gay rights because. 70% of Americans know somebody who's gay. We need to do the same thing in the trans community. Each individual can make a huge 
huge impact simply by coming out right where they are in their business, in their home, in their community, in their neighborhood. So I hope more people will come out. That's a fantastic way to end what's been a really interesting, enlightening conversation. Um, to the listeners and viewers, um, don't hesitate to jump in on the community pages to share your ideas or ask questions that we didn't have time to get to today. Um, to build on this discussion, our next Google Hangout will be on a different day next week. It's on Wednesday, December 18th at 2 o'clock Eastern. Thanks to everyone in the uh, TED Med community. And just thanks to the team members, all of you have been really great. It's been really good to listen to you and hear your ideas. Um, and of course, thank you to the Robert Wood uh, Johnson Foundation. Um, goodbye, everyone. It's been really a good conversation. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank Take you. care.